David, thanks for being here today. You can, you can do it. Yeah. Is your microphone working? I think so, and I'm right. pretty sure I know how to use Keynote. Let's try it. Yeah, so thanks for the introduction, Toby, and, and thanks for the invitation to come and speak. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, I thought I knew how to use Keynote, rocks. Um, so this will not be a particularly recording in progress technical talk. Um, Got it. Will not be a particularly technical talk. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the motivations, a little bit about the earth science and the background, discuss the sort of geodynamic and the modeling aspect of what we've been doing, talk a little bit about where we're going, and then I'll also talk a little bit about where we came from and the lessons sort of that I learned along the way. And hopefully some of this is useful for new Petsy users and people who want to be developers. And it's not an endorsement. Uh, it is a personal account, my own experiences. So if people disagree, just let me know. No problem. So let's start with some background earth sciences to sort of set the scene of what I'm going to talk about. You've probably seen this familiar onion type model of the earth separated into these different parts, inner core, outer core, mantle, crust, okay? And what I want you to do is basically take your eye and focus from the sort of left to the right. That's the direction we're going. So in this talk, we're gonna focus on what's happening in the mantle domain, the mantle crust domain. So in the upper sort of 3,000 kilometers, okay? And we're gonna continue focusing our eye upwards towards the surface. You'll see why in a few slides. And we're actually primarily going to be interested in looking at the, say, upper 300 kilometers, modeling the upper 300 kilometers of what we'll refer to as the solid Earth. Okay, and you know, it's um, something you've probably seen before that you have these different compositions, right? Different types of material, continental crust, oceanic crust, and the lithosphere, asthenosphere. These are terms you may have seen before. Um, these are the types of materials that we're going to be modeling and I'll discuss in a little more detail what these different types of materials are and their constitutive behavior. Okay, so our present day understanding of the dynamics of the solid earth largely originates from our current working paradigm, plate tectonics. It's a paradigm, so it is a model and it's a good model, it's the current paradigm, because it explains a lot of observations. It has a lot of consistency in terms of things we observe um, in the context of Earth. Now what this paradigm consists of, is essentially a description of uh, the surface of the Earth being sort of composed of lithospheric plates. There are essentially seven major plates, and these represent about 95% of the surface of the Earth. These plates are composed of a mixture of different type of lithospheric materials, oceanic material, continental, or oceanic lithosphere, continental lithosphere. These plates, they move, they translate, they rotate, they deform primarily along their boundaries, and they interact along their boundaries. And the types of interaction that occur depend on the type of boundary. So for example, in this picture on the right, you see different types of plate boundaries depicted. Um, the red lines there depict regions, convergent boundaries, where you have plates moving towards each other, and you can see some of them have sort of converging arrows. I don't know where my cursor is, but uh, oh, I broke keynote, man. Oh, there we go. Um, so the red regions are convergent zones, the blue regions are divergent zones, where oceanic lithosphere is being created, and uh, different types of physical processes happen at these different boundaries, okay? An important part of this paradigm is that it's time dependent, okay? It's not static. It's dynamic and time dependent. And importantly, there's a, um, a time uh, relative time scale uh, difference between what the physics of what happens. So it's a viscoelastic model. Things that happen on the short time scales, the dynamics are described by a different set of equations compared to the dynamics of the long time scale, okay? So one of the observations that the paradigm correctly or consistently, consistently explains is earthquakes. So this is a, on the left uh, a map view of earthquakes uh, that have occurred and been recorded over the last several years. And what you'll notice is these are you know, specifically predominantly located along the, the boundaries, actually along those plate boundaries. Excuse me. Um, the black dots there you'll see are um, eruptions, volcanic eruptions that have occurred. 
And, you know, in conjunction with earthquakes, there are other hazards associated with that, you know, size, release of seismic energy, specifically tsunamis. And the interesting thing, uh, maybe it's shocking and a little bit scary, is seismic events actually happen all the time. So these are just two pictures I pulled off, uh, you know, monitoring websites last night, USGS and NOAA. And, you know, there's magnitude six earthquakes just a couple of days ago, right? So you know, earthquakes are happening all the time. You may not hear about them in the news, but the seismologists know. And uh, they're recorded. They're, they're occurring all the time. And it's along with them, you know, offshore earthquakes resulting in tsunamis all the time. So we have some observations and constraints and understanding of the rheology and the material or constitutive behavior of rocks. They are ductile and they're brittle. And these are some, you know, in the top, top right, you see some examples of what would look like, and you'd probably be convinced, is ductile flow. You can see these layers in the rock that have been bent. This is an outcrop, that's a small child for scale. Um, below that, you see what looks like brittle fracture, okay? You have these, in the upper region, this block that looks like it's been rotated and snapped, and you've got all these independent little pieces, and they're rotating in something that looks ductile. Okay, these are just field observations from an outcrop, but you can do, uh, you can perform experiments in the lab and you can see that you have shear zones that develop due to, you know, excess confining pressure. So we know that rocks are from lab experiments, highly temperature dependent, strain rate dependent, pressure dependent, and path dependent. There's a history, right? There's, these processes depend on, and the state of stress depends on the path and the sort of temporal space time and temperature history that the rock has, has undergone or taken. And specifically, I want to emphasize this, that the instability of rocks resulting from shear fracture or unstable, unstable stable sliding at high pressure is actually the main cause of shallow great earthquakes. These are the ones you don't want to know about. So in terms of locality of our observations, we have this kind of representation of space, or let's say time and depth. Okay, it's a space-time diagram. Note time goes backwards. Zero is the present day. Four giga, GA means four giga years backwards in time. Okay, and so what sort of lives on these two axes, the sort of depth equals zero, that's everything you can see that on the Earth's surface at the moment. If you walk around in the field, everything on the um, time equals zero axis going down is what you can basically image or probe or infer from geophysics, so using seismicity or seismic studies. And so you have this kind of geophysics on one axis, geology on the other axis, and a whole large volume, or area in this case, of, un, sort of, pl of places in space and time where you don't have direct observations or direct data that you can, um, something you can measure. So if you think about this in terms of an earthquake, if you really need to understand the state of stress on a fault at the present day, you really need to know the path of uh, the evolution of that material at the, from the past to the present day to be able to say anything about inferring what the actual state of stress is. So if you wanted to use modeling, this would be a great place because that path, that space-time history that the rock has sort of been subjected to actually lives in an area where there's no direct observations. And that's what we do. We basically perform modeling to fill in this void in the space-time diagram. Okay, so in terms of the time scales of interest, they are huge. We have seismic processes that occur in seconds or minutes, and you have everything going all the way, so that's sort of in the elastic domain. You have time scales that will range up to millions of years. These are the viscous time scales or viscous domains where you're looking at entire continents being pulled apart or deformed or rotated or processes of subduction occurring. So you have these very large range of time scales and as a result, people have developed specialized modeling tools to target specific timescale ranges. And I've tried to indicate that with the, the colors here and the, the sort of width of the intervals are indicated by these colors. Um, so, you know, on the far left, the short time scale, you have things, elastic dynamics, wave propagation, dynamic rupture. These are simulation tools that let you you know, describe frictional processes on a failure plane or fault that you discretize. You consistently solve that um, and evolve the friction law on the fault and produce uh, and study and simulate the waves that radiate from that process. You have cycling, seismic cycling models which consider sort of thousand year time scales and include multiple earthquakes, not just single earthquakes, so it's a cycle, some sort of periodic cycle where you load, you slip, you fail, and then you load again and you continue to do that 
Then you have these regional scale genomic processes which consider million year time scales. These are the things that I'm going to focus on today. And the reason why I put all of these up there is in an ideal world, if we really wanted to be able to maybe provide some meaningful physics-based hazard assessments, we'd like to be able to sort of take all of the information from the large space scale, long time scale, and move it down into these short time scale modeling processes so that we could consistently have, you know, um, material properties defined that are thermomechanically consistent on the long time scale and use them in the short time scale models to create realistic, um, physically meaningful and valid uh, physics-based assessments of earthquakes. So that's the end game. That's the looking forward part. We haven't done it. So modeling the long-term dynamics, so focusing on this um, regional scale geodynamics section there. Um, essentially, it's the, the material, the domain is described as an incompressible flow. You have a highly nonlinear constitutive law, so a highly effective, highly nonlinear effective viscosity. The models, um, you know, the material undergoes large deformation, large strain because the time scales that you're doing the simulations over is very long. You have history dependent material behavior, thermomechanical, thermomechanical coupling, so the, the viscosity is a strong function of temperature, as is the buoyancy, the forcing term, and the momentum equation. We also need to consider the evolution of the free surface. Topography is one of the physical quantities on Earth that is very well constrained. So there are good reasons that you, and other physical reasons, why you want to include free surface in your models. And we need to perform these calculations in three spatial dimensions and time. And so this is generally, I'm going to talk about finite element approaches that deal with uh, the sort of flow part of this problem. And then to address large deformation, large strain, and history dependent material behavior, what has generally been adopted as the, I wouldn't say method of choice, but approach of choice in the field is to say, take you know, the idealization of the picture in the middle. We would like to create a, let's say in this case, a 2D numerical model of it over on the right. The different colors represent different materials. So wet quartz, dry olivine, linear viscous. These are materials that have distinctly different constitutive behavior. And we want to track the evolution of those material domains over time. And so what people do, a method that's worked really well, is to use material point type methods, Lagrangian particle methods, where you assign the constitutive behavior to a particle or a point. That point is then um, you know, placed in space, depending on where it lives in space. In the initial condition, it's either green, um, yellow, or brown. And then you track these particles over time. And the sort of interaction with the, say, background finite element mesh is done through a projection where you take, say, the effective viscosity on the particle and you project it onto the mesh. And then use that in your finite element uh, solve. And so this is, people have been doing this for a long time. Um, and I wanted to sort of summarize, it's hard to do a f full justice to, to the field in one little slide, but I tried to separate it um, into two distinct schools of thought or efforts and approach. And I think something that resonated with me is all of these tools have generally resonated with a earlier speaker. All these tools are developed by earth scientists, okay? they're not applied mathematicians or CS people. Um, so they're generally written in-house because this problem's not interesting enough to have any commercial package support it, right? The user group is so small that CFX, Fluent, whoever answers, they don't really want to you know, invest time supporting this type of, um, you know, solving these types of equations. So have, people have to roll their own codes. And what's always been emphasized is for a given computational resource, let's generate a model with the, uh, you know, maximize the uh, resolution of the model, okay? So largest number of cells you can manage and have it be as robust as possible because the constitutive laws generate very large contrasts in material properties. So maybe six, seven, eight orders of magnitude change in viscosity over very small regions. So those top, that top left figure, you have shear zones. They're very narrow. There may be one or two grid cells and there's a very large you know, 10 to the 6 jump in viscosity there. So you need very robust solvers to deal with that, solving that problem. And so because they've wanted to maximize resolution, they want to choose the, a discretization with the smallest possible memory footprint. And they've all chosen 
almost exclusively Q1P0. So that's great. It's low order, few degrees of freedom. And then they say, well, it's hard to solve that with multigrid. So we'll use sparse direct. We're going to throw in a penalty as there so we can eliminate the kind of two, two by two block system and just solve for the velocity. And boom, let's go. And so people did that for a long time. Um, and you know, could actually get a long way in 2D, uh, albeit the results of pressure may be um, questionable because it's a not you know non insup stable element but you know people made progress that way but then then they try to scale it out into 3d this whole thing just breaks down right they don't get very far the memory requirements go up massively because they're dependent on sparse direct the scalability of the sparse direct solver is it's not as good as they hoped for and so things started to you know dis come apart a little bit People also tried this approach with multigrid, that's the figure in the middle, and had more success because they're at least using a scalable algorithm to solve the elliptic part of the problem. But the sort of dependence or reluctance to move into away from Q1, P0 actually causes scalability problems because as you refine, the conditioning of the problem gets worse and the problem becomes kind of pathological to precondition as you continue to refine the mesh. So it also not really lended itself to a scalable option. Uh, and this was, you know, early 2000s and before mid 2000. And so, in, in two, 2014, I, I decided to just depart from this and use a stable discretization, even though it's going to be expensive. The emphasis is still the same: maximize the sort of subdomain size you can fit in an MPI rank, but at least you have a stable method. And the advantages of having that stable scheme is you can actually precondition it, like optimally, with optimal methods, with scalable methods, with you know, and it's provable. So you can actually run really large scale models without having this scalability issue come in because of the discretization. Uh, we also use, uh, you know, full space Newton type solvers for this, um, this code that we developed. We have some interesting multi-grid uh, ideas thrown in there to, to enable you to really scale this out to either strong scale or to weak scale, depending on which kind of study you want to do. And ultimately, this was you know, purely written for 3D applications because that's where the, the bottleneck was in the community in the, you know, around 2010. Okay, this is code um, called Peter Tan. And I'll talk a little bit about Peter Tan, what's in it, and what then transitioned into Petsy. Um, that's, I think, interesting uh, to see how software that's developed for me and my you know, and fellow geodynamicists actually ended up being useful for the broader community through Petsy. So some of the things about Peter Tan that um, you know, we needed to spend some time on to make, you know, to realize those objectives of being scalable, fast, large subdomains is um, summarized on the next slide. So one of the choices is to you know, always use, um, iterate on the full space. So define the problem in terms of this you know, there's a Newton uh, linearization, and then you have the linearized problem to solve. That's given by this block matrix over there. And we always use um, field split. Well, first, we have the two by two structure. We use field split to define the preconditioner. That already opens up a huge number of doors in terms of solver configuration. We also implemented a lot of um, uh, matrix-free kernels for this code because the memory footprint from assembling that Q2P1 operator is heavy, okay? So if we assembled, we would have, you know, on a typical machine per MPI rank, maybe you have, so I started on a blue gene, a BGQ, you only had about two gigabytes of RAM per MPI rank. So it had to be very lightweight unless you wanted to run with, you know, six by six by six sort of Q2, Q2, uh, element subdomains, which is way too small. So everything's matrix-free. But we have the option to switch, okay? So in the Petsy spirit of having runtime configurability for many things like solvers, we also do it for matrix-free or assembled. Um, we also have some specialized uh, tensor product kernels and, uh, uh, for scalar and with AVX implementations that Jed wrote um, to speed up those matrix-free kernels. The other thing that's good about doing that is, of course, the arithmetic intensity is much better with the matrix-free stuff. So we already go faster just by running things matrix-free by factor of three or six, depending on whether you use AVX or not. Um, in the same spirit with Petsy's database, runtime database, we have a lot of customization and flexibility in how we define the multi-grid hierarchy. So 
um, you know, we, we allow the user to, at runtime, select whether we want to create coarse grids using assembled operators, matrix-free operators, using Galerkin coarsening, or even using Galerkin coarsening where the fine grid was actually a matrix-free operator in the first place. So we have all these choices to try and tune and tweak the, the model depending on the characteristics of the problem um, you're solving. Also, repartitioning of the, the coarse grids is something else that was introduced to enable you to really strong scale out to the point that you just had one, set, one Q2 cell per MPI rank and, and have very deep hierarchies, okay? So in terms of yeah, the solver flexibility, we use field split. Um, this allows all the favorite flavors of solvers to be configured at runtime, sure complement reduction. Uh, we prefer the sort of full space upper block triangular approach where you can then play with how you want to configure the inexactness of the JUU block. Um, again, I mentioned this before, this sort of runtime flexibility of shell versus mat AIJ. And you know, a lot of the stuff we did, we actually renamed the library and called it the Pen Pen Portable Extensible Toolkit for Solver Composition because actually the way it's designed let us do so many things with the solver stack. It actually was mind blowing how many different combinations or permutations there were to put the solver together and find something that's fast. But the, the, the nice thing is for any challenging problem, we were always able to you know, kind of <laughs> do this crazy dance through the option tree to, to find something that would work without having to write new code for the most part. Um, and so now I want to just highlight some of the things that migrated. So in our efforts to minimize the memory footprint, um, MatNest appeared because it seemed crazy to me that you always had to duplicate and copy everything. If you assembled this monolithic two by two and then you field split it, you know, there's a huge amount of memory. So I really was unpleased by that, uh, and we put together MatNest. I'll make a comment about this at the end, about the names of these objects. So MatNest is one thing that was developed in the course of this sort of wish or desire to minimize the memory footprint um, for geodynamic applications. Um, we used Chebyshev as the smoother, and we used GCR. So GCR was written basically to support these types of methods that you might want to apply as the outer solver for the saddle system um, because it's a flexible creel of methods so you can do crazy nonlinear stuff inside and, you, and then the method on the outside won't break down. We wrote pipeline creel, creel of methods because we had ambitions to scale out on very large uh, communicator sizes and this unstructured grid kind of repartitioning was ended up um, being something very useful and then being packaged up and put into PETC and called PC telescope. Um, and the history variables were discretized via Lagrangian particles. So this was basically a specialized object written to allow arbitrary data types to be associated with the particle and to deal with the sort of constant dynamic sizing, resizing of that point cloud um, per MPI rank as the particles of VECT move around. Maybe you want to destroy them or delete them, or maybe they leave the domain. This is a special data structure to do that and a special communication object to handle the kind of sort of non-symmetric communication pattern you have when dealing with particle data. This actually is what became DM Swarm. Um, and so it's, it's really cool because, um, you know, the stuff that we write in our applications has wide usage outside of our domain-specific area. Um, and so, you know, what helped me a lot is to talk to the developers to find out, hey, is this something you want? Is it something you need? Um, you know, figure out the feasibility, assess how to do it, maybe generalize it or change it, and then actually work with the developers, um, depending on who's interested and available, to actually get, and get it integrated into PETC. Um, the telescope and DM Swarm required lots of discussions uh, because we had differing opinions of what the DM should be or shouldn't be and what telescope should or shouldn't be. But, you know, what's nice and one of the cool things about PETC is the team is very open especially if you just do stuff, okay? Um, that's always been the approach that, you know, just do it and then uh, it goes in and you can thrash it out later. Um, and what's nice about it for you as a user is you kind of unload the maintenance burden, right? As soon as you take something out of your code base and put it in PETC, it's not your problem anymore. It's a whole group of other people's problems. So it's nice for you. Re re reduce the size of your own code base. You're sharing your work with others, which is you know, outside your community, which is really cool. And you get to work with great people on a great project. And one day, you know, you can become a Petsy developer. So Petsy rocks. 
um, this is a statement of what I model using Petsy and how great Petsy is. I've been using Petsy for 20 something years, I think, and you know, what I do wouldn't be possible without it. Um, and there's a number of reasons I put there. The last two I think are pretty important. I actually think I got a, to become a better programmer or better, better at CS and software design and, and actually algorithms by using and reading Petsy code than taking courses at university. And, um, and the development team is great, right? It, without them, it wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have stuck around for so long. So the, the development team is really cool and the support they give is really cool. So thank you, Petsy team. Thank you for listening. You, David. Any questions? So as someone who was in grad school during some of this, it was very interesting to track uh, the passage of things from what I think was called Petsy Plus or something along those lines. Petsy or a Ext. Lot. Yeah, Petsy yeah. Ext, e -X -T, right? Yeah. And, and track the way that they you know, got refined and, and became available to everyone. So I think it's a real success story for uh, what's, what the library's been able to do in the community around it. Yeah, and it was definitely a case of me interacting with Petsy to get my stuff into Petsy, not, not the other way. And I think then it's, you know, it works because there's some control, quality control over what's, what's going in and... Um, but not really. No, not really. A little bit. The, 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 only, the only thing I left out on this slide is that I don't, you don't always get to choose the name of the object when it goes into Petsy. Um, <laughs> I didn't choose most of those names and I still don't like some of them. <laughs> but that, that's a small detail. And the just do it philosophy is still true, but it, it's also coupled with a more rigorous uh, merge request and, and uh, continuous integration now than it maybe was back in the day. Th that is true. A lot has changed and I've stopped contributing since then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but there's other reasons for that. I mean, I'm just busy. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time.